Hi, everybody. Welcome to the November 2023, the third anniversary edition of Living Histories. And we are so excited to have super special speakers with us for this super special edition, launching right in with Savash Day from University of Chicago. Savash, please uh, tell us about Living very many different histories. Sure thing. Thank you very much, Sri, for the invitation. It's great to be here with so many excellent uh, researchers. So I am a professor of uh, molecular engineering and genomics and systems biology at the University of Chicago. And um, this is a generic title that I pulled from uh, many talks, but it's a good uh, sort of example of what we do in our lab. So essentially what we're trying to do is um, trying to understand and mathematically and or computationally model immune signaling networks using a range of uh, signaling, um, sorry, single cell tools, including proteomics. So I will start first by introducing my background. So um, probably unlike many of you here, I actually come from um, a non-biological research background. My, uh, I'm an immigrant to the United States. I came from Turkey. I did my undergrad in Turkey in uh, physics. Then I moved to a bunch of places and ultimately landed mm -hmm. in the University of Arizona in the College of Optical Sciences doing essentially uh, optical physics and photonics research. So I started out with physics because I was very excited about understanding nature, how it works. And it seemed like physics is a good way or a good place to start. And that kind of took me into this uh, uh, direction. So I worked on a range of things during my PhD, including um, nonlinear um, <clears throat> photorefractive materials. These are materials where you can record optical information and read them out and then change them. So they are uh, sensitive, uh, they are dynamic in that sense. So essentially this research was really like uh, material science research but had a lot of optical uh, engineering components to it. Then I worked in dynamic imaging through uh, scattering media, essentially trying to see through scattering environments like tissue, atmosphere, using these kind of materials that we uh, engineered. Then um, we had this big project where we tried to develop the first uh, dynamical, updatable holographic three-dimensional display. This is essentially um, a three-dimensional display that you see without goggles, any kind of specialty eyewear. So it's straight on the screen, but it's three-dimensional. So you have parallax and all kinds of depth cues, something that could also be changed. So that was the new thing. So that was kind of my first major impact into research. That paper was published in Nature back in 2008. Um, I was very excited. I did a few other projects also in photonics, but essentially my uh, research started with hardcore uh, optical physics and material science. So during uh, after my PhD, I, I was very committed to going into academic research and I had options in obviously in optics, but I really wanted to go into biological research. And the initial idea was to apply all the, the, uh, the skills and tools that we developed in optics into biological research applications, like biophotonics and that kind of thing. Somehow I stumbled upon uh, Steve Quake's lab uh, at Stanford. He he had the history of develop, you know um, dealing with or I'd say um, mentoring people like myself coming from different research areas into biological research, and um, so I, I I ended up in this in this rather very biological research topic, which is immunological signaling. So it was a collaboration with Marcus Covert's lab, who was a, a assistant professor in the bioengineering department back in uh, to, uh, late 2000s. So I started working on NF-kappa-B and since then, uh, NF-kappa-B signaling, and since then I've been working on it. So these are you know, cartoons of complex signaling networks. You can make measurements. This is like the cell membrane, there are receptors, bunch of uh, proteins talking to each other, connecting and ultimately regulating transcription. And it's a very important signaling pathway. And it has been kind of the poster child of a lot of mathematical modeling approaches, which I kind of brought from my physics background already into this field. I had to learn a lot of biology, but uh, we were combining these biological research questions, 
uh, pathway analysis and mathematical modeling. And uh, we, we ended up publishing a few papers in this area, uh, especially this first paper uh, during my postdoc, which ended up uh, in Nature uh, again. Uh, and fairly quickly, within two years, I was able to pull this off. And this kind of set my biological research direction. From that on, I was very dedicated to this field. And it also was a paper where we uh, introduced the use of single cell dynamics into these uh, pathway analysis. And it has been an influential paper for pretty much all the single cell work that came after that. So I've been working in this uh, area for a long time. You could call this biophysics, you could call it bio systems biology, you could call it quantitative biology, whatever it is, but it, it always involves experimental uh, analyses, some technology and a lot of computational analysis. So you can ask questions like how do cells process different signaling molecules? How, how do they process extra, extracellular inputs from pathogens? How do they regulate uh, gene expression in space and time? All of these questions can be answered using this um, uh, pathway as a model system. Um, in addition to this, uh, both in uh, ETH, where, where I was a uh, assistant professor also in Chicago, we have been developing a range of technologies, essentially because of the need for various measurements that are not currently possible. You know, we want to say, analyze protein networks in single cells. Well, you can't do that in at the single cell level uh, beyond like single proteins, maybe you want to measure dimers. And so we developed those kind of technologies. So this research has been ongoing and it kind of uh, benefits from my PhD research where we did a lot of technological development. So that has been an ongoing topic in our uh, lab. So, so this is my background. And my journey obviously is non-traditional. I have made um, major shifts in direction multiple times, but especially after my PhD, I made a huge change. I mean, having never done biology before, I went to a very deep biological topic. Um, it has been both nice and hard at the same time, but the reasons for, for these big direction changes, I think for me has been always like, my overall dissatisfaction with my previous trajectory. So in physics and also many areas of engineering, these are such mature areas that um, what you're trying to do is really at the edge of what is already has been developed and very strongly uh, established, right? Maxwell's equations describe all optics and they have been known for 150 years. You're not gonna invent something that will change that. Whereas in biology, biology is wide open. So there are, there's this, you know, if you're into new things and you want to discover new things, there are a lot more opportunities I felt in biological research that didn't exist in physics. At least the, the, the difficulty in physics is much harder. You know, the, the new experiments, the large Hadron Collider or go to the, you know, the, um, uh, the instrument LIGO, I think the measures, the gravitational waves, these are huge instruments huge investments. So with biology, you're focused on your tiny thing, but pretty much every time you're looking into an entirely new phenomena. So I was very excited about that. Um, so, but also some of it is really luck or fate or whatever you call it, because I might have gone into just biotechnology research. I ended up in this, you know, immune signaling problem with uh, Steve and Marcus, and that kind of pushed me into really deep biology but that has been both hard and good and uh, also like very very fruitful because uh, with, with tools from physics and engineering you can really do some impact into these uh, fundamentally important biological research questions the difficulties of course have been understanding what is relevant and what is not because um, as, as an outsider you don't have that knowledge somebody but it needs to tell you that you need to read a lot of papers. Uh, and often, uh, unless you do extremely broad reading for a long time, this never develops. Um, so I still don't feel like I fully have a full understanding of what is relevant and what is important for a biologist. I am interested in certain questions, but it's sometimes difficult to convince everybody that those questions are important. Uh, and of course, another difficulty has been learning the biological, you know, basics 
as well as the current research uh, directions. Biology is maybe very shallow because we don't have a very strong theoretical background and you don't need to learn, you know, calculus, statistical mechanics, uh, you know, classical mechanics, electrodynamics, quantum mechanics, ultimately to go into solid state. This is what you need to do under to understand solid state physics, right? In biology, you don't have that, but you have a lot of knowledge that is very broadly distributed and in multiple sources. So bringing all that together has been uh, very difficult and it's an ongoing work. And lastly, the trust issues and recognition because you know, coming from a, as an outsider, a physics uh, graduate student, um, people have, you know, had doubts about you and they you need to do a lot more to prove that you can really do this and do it properly. So those were the difficulties. What was not really difficult, difficult was the experiments. Experiments are fairly easy compared to what we were doing in uh, physics and engineering. Yes, there's a lot of noise variability. There's a lot of statistics involved, but overall, fairly easy experiment. So I was pretty much operational within the first two months of uh, starting doing uh, re biological research. So from my journey, I think the take home messages are, if you wanna do such drastic changes and go from engineering or physics to biology research, you, first you need to find a mentor who's done it themselves and who has a track record of doing this successfully. Uh, with Steve, I found that and uh, I think it's important. And I think it's also important to be pragmatic and set a deadline. Uh, in postdoc, I set myself a deadline. Hey, if I'm not getting a good paper in my postdoc within the next three years, this is not for me and I'm going to do something else. Could have not worked. I was lucky. But I think it's important to do that because this could be like an endless journey. And uh, it depends on where you are in your career stage, in your life. I think it's good to put a solid deadline for yourself and see whether this will work or not. Finding something you can enjoy a long time is important, obviously. And then within that deadline, stay the course. Don't look elsewhere. Don't look into, for example, offers from industry, which might be very appealing. Say, hey, I'm going to do such a similar work, either PhD or postdoc. Do that during that time and don't look into these other things because it's very tempting to, you know, take a... <laughs> you know, uh, some other, you know, exit and then go somewhere else because it's much easier and, you know, better pay. Finally, <clears throat> understand that you can bring something valuable to the table as an outsider. You have probably tools, a different view viewpoint, different skills that people in the field may not always have. So these are things that make you valuable. And I will always say, go back to point number one, find a mentor because this is not an easy thing to pull off uh, alone. So with that, I'll uh, stop here and take any questions if we have time. And otherwise, we'll go to the next uh, speaker. Thank you, Savash. Um, I'm on behalf of the audience. I'm clapping and um, very grateful for the inspiring messages at the end. And in the interest of time, I am going to ask one quick question. Um, which is that from your story, it's clear that you have learned and mastered many languages, some language languages and some uh, scientific languages, and um, have also enjoyed being a pioneer in some ways. But at each stage, how did you find community? How did you find the people who understood and uh, gave you constructive feedback at each of these stages? In some stages, I did not find a community. Uh, that, well, that's what I'm referring to when I say trust issues. You're a non-biologist. You're trying to do biology. You're trying to do immunology. That's like insane, right? You're never going to be accepted by the broad immunology community unless, until you find, publish like 10 papers. So community, I did not rely on that. And I did not always have a good one. I still do not consider I have a one community, to be honest. Uh, but that has not been absolutely necessary. You do your own thing, just do quality work, and hopefully people will appreciate it ultimately. Thank you. On that very inspiring note, On in the interest of time, I'm closing the recording.